Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 4 of Lippincott's biochemistry textbook. In this chapter we're going to go over fibrous proteins, mainly going over collagen and elastin. If you enjoy the video, please don't forget to give it a like and more importantly subscribe to the channel as it does help us out. And also if you'd like to support the channel you can do so in the Patreon link below. Otherwise let's jump straight into fibrous proteins talking about how they serve as a structural component within the body. So this forms the structure of our cells, our extracellular matrix and also our tendons etc. So they have this unique structure where the primary amino acids form into these secondary structural elements. Remember we talked about our globular proteins and how they have this primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structural elements. The fibrous proteins are more concerned with the secondary structural elements. So starting off talking about collagen, this is the most abundant protein within the body. Quite simply, it's just three polypeptides wrapped around one another in a rope-like triple helix. So these three polypeptides are each called an alpha chain. And depending on the organization of these alpha chains will determine the structural role of the collagen and it is dependent on which organ it is found within. Now these three alpha chains are all bound together by hydrogen bonds to keep them nice and secured with one another. And then the actual amino acids within them is what determines its structure and function. So we'll get into that briefly here as well. Starting off by talking about the three types or organizations of collagen. So you can see on the side here we have fibril forming, network forming, and fibril associated organizations for our collagens. Now the fibril forming include collagen types 1, 2 and 3 and these ones give our classic rope-like structure like the bottom here. So the nice triple helix rope-like structure that provides a lot of tensile strength to whichever organ it's within. So for the type 1 that's for skin, bone, tendons, for type 2, cartilage, vitreous body, intervertebral discs, and type 3, mainly our blood vessels and skin and muscle. So that's the fibril forming the nice rope-like structure. The next two, which includes types 4 and 8 collagens, these create a three-dimensional mesh rather than distinct fibrils, as you can see over in figure 4.4 here. This is more a mesh work, and this is what forms our basement membranes, in various organs and in the corneal and vascular endothelium. And then lastly we have fibril associated. So these kind of link the collagen fibrils together. And this includes types 9 and 12. So type 9 for cartilage, 12 for tendons, ligaments and some other tissues. So that's one way to organize our collagen into fibril forming or rope forming, network forming and then fibril associated where it's more connecting those fibrils together. When it comes to the actual structure of our collagen, it's really rich in the two amino acids proline and glycine. The reason for proline is that it has the structural ring within it. Remember we've talked about that in previous chapters. So this ring within the actual R group of the amino acid allows it to get this kink within the actual structure which creates that helical structure. So it is allowing that collagen molecule, that alpha chain, to kink in a kink and spiral around. Whereas glycine, this is found in every third position within our collagen, and that's because it's one of the smallest amino acids. So usually we're going to have a three amino acid repeating sequence of glycine, X and then Y, where X and Y are different amino acids. Typically X is a proline and typically Y is actually a hydroxyproline. Hydroxyproline or hydroxylysine just means these amino acids have been hydroxylated after they've been incorporated into the actual polypeptide chain. So it's a post-translational modification to these amino acids. Now we can also glycosylate these hydroxyl groups, which just means that you're adding in a sugar. So we can have these multiple additions to the amino acids, starting off with hydroxylation, and then we can glycosylate those hydroxyl groups as well by adding glucose or galactose. So the polypeptides that actually come and form into collagen, they are formed by fibroblasts. So fibroblasts are our precursor cells that creates the collagen molecule and then spits it out into the extracellular matrix. It starts off with the production of proteins 
through alpha chains, which is our precursor of our collagen molecule altogether. So pro-alpha chains are the very first step. These alpha chains then get hydroxylated. So remember, that occurs to our prolines and our lysine amino acids within those polypeptide chains. But importantly, in order to hydroxylate these amino acids, we need vitamin C and iron. Now, I bring out vitamin C because vitamin C deficiency results in a disease called scurvy, which is what plagued pirates back in the day because they didn't have vitamin C sources on their ships until they started taking oranges and other fruits that contain vitamin C to prevent scurvy. So vitamin C is needed for this hydroxylation to allow our collagen to actually get formed. Without vitamin C, our collagen in our body is very weak. And the most obvious clinical sign for that is that you have a bleeding tendency because all of your collagen, let's say in your gums are weak and particularly within the actual blood vessels themselves are weak, so they're easily broken down. So that's our second step in collagen formation, is hydroxylation. Then we glycosylate our amino acids, so that's adding the glucose and the galactose, and then they get assembled to be secreted from that fibroblast. So these pro-alpha chains that have been hydroxylated and glycosylated, they now form pro-collagen, which occurs due to the production of these disulfide bonds to actually hold them together. Once the pro-collagen forms, they move into the Golgi apparatus to then go to a secretory vessel or to then be released into the extracellular space. So in the extracellular space, you have pro-collagen, and then in the extracellular space, that pro-collagen gets cleaved by NNC pro-collagen peptidizers to remove the terminal peptides and then create these tropocollagen molecules. From there, the tropocollagen molecules spontaneously associate with themselves to form a collagen fibril. And then the last step here is lysyl oxidase that deaminates some of the lysine and hydroxylysine within the collagen, which then allows these residuals to actually bunch up to some of the neighboring collagen molecules and essentially form a covalent crosslink between them. So the formation of mature collagen fibers includes this deamination by lysyl oxidase to then allow these covalent bonds or crosslinks to form. And then we get this strong structure of collagen. When it comes to breaking up the collagen, typically it actually lasts for quite a long time. It's quite a strong type of molecule or protein that has a half-life as long as several years. But it can be broken down by some enzymes called collagenases, which is really just a part of this large family of matrix metalloproteinases. So that's one way you can break down your collagen. When it comes to issues in your collagen, we have these two main diseases here, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is just a big umbrella term for a lot of connective tissue disorders that are heritable and really result from the deficiency of collagen processing enzymes. So for instance, a lysyl hydroxylase or maybe our N-pro-collagen peptidizers. These all result in defective formation of our collagen. The classic form involves an issue in type 5 collagen, so then that results in skin extensibility and fragility. So as you can see in this figure 4.10 over here, but then there's also this vascular form as well from type three collagen defects. And this is very serious because you can result in arterial rupture because they can just spontaneously burst essentially. So that includes one of our collagenopathies. Our other one is osteogenesis imperfecta. And this is also colloquially known as brittle bone disease because it's an issue with our bone fragility. So clearly there's an issue in the collagen that forms our bone. The majority of the time, 80% of cases, it's causing a dominant mutation in the alpha one or alpha two chains of type one collagen. And it's usually because of this glycine replacement by other amino acids with bulky side chains. So now you get this brittle bone that's not very strong. They can have a very variable type of severity. So quite mild all the way to a lethal form where obviously you don't make it. So those are our collagen defects or collagen in general. Next, we're gonna talk about elastin, which is another connective tissue protein, but instead it has more rubber-like properties. So elastin is kind of like a rubber band. It can be stretched and then snapped back into its original shape. So it's very important in our lungs, the walls of our large arteries, and other elastic ligaments as well. It's an insoluble protein polymer, but its precursor is actually a soluble polypeptide composed of a lot of amino acids, up to 700 amino acids. 
Once again, it's rich in proline like collagen, but it's also rich in lysine and has very little amounts of hydroxyproline or hydroxylysine. Once again, it gets formed into this tropoelastin that gets secreted into the extracellular matrix, where it then gets produced into elastin when it interacts with glycoproteins and then also with some action with the lysyl oxidase as well. One of the more common diseases of our elastic tissue is Marfan syndrome, which is an issue or a mutation. Now, fibrillin-1 protein. This allows an abnormal fibrillin protein to get incorporated into microfibrils, including normal fibrillin, which then inhibits the formation of functional microfibrils. So then your elastic tissue in your body is abnormal. Main point there, Marfan syndrome, elastic tissue disorder. And then lastly here we have antitrypsin, which is involved with actually saving our elastic tissue. So elastin is broken down by several proteases and that is inhibited by alpha-1 antitrypsin. So alpha-1 antitrypsin helps elastin to stick around longer. That is the key point there. It is synthesized by the liver and it has an important role in the lungs because in the lungs, neutrophils that get activated from bacteria that gets inhaled or for whatever reason, those neutrophils are gonna release elastase, which would normally break down our elastic tissue within our lungs. However, we have this alpha-1 antitrypsin from our liver, which helps to break down or at least inhibit our elastase, so then our elastic tissue is saved. You can see in this image here, neutrophil elastase is represented by this little alligator clip looking thing on the side here. And then our alpha-1 antitrypsin is this ring that binds over the mouth of the elastase. So you can see, Neutrophil activation results in breakdown of elastic tissue, but then our alpha-1 antitrypsin is able to inhibit the elastase from actually breaking down all that elastic tissue. So clearly if you have a disorder in your alpha-1 antitrypsin, then you're going to result in increased breakdown of your elastic tissue, and that can predispose you to a pulmonary disease called emphysema. So that's what it's talking about over there. And the side here, we don't produce an alpha-1 antitrypsin, which can occur due to a genetic disorder where you have a single purine-based mutation and then that results in widespread breakdown in your elastic tissue. That can be cured by intravenous administration of alpha-1 antitrypsin every single week. So that is the summary of chapter four. There is another little summary page here. Feel free to pause it at this region or pause it on the side here if you want the questions and then there's the answers. So I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Feel free to drop a comment, otherwise we'll see you in the next one.